Two Fish, we are ready to begin when you are. Ready to go. Ready to go on two. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Joyce Light, Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT, here with our students. Are you ready? Oh yeah, Joyce, I'm ready. <laughs> Jack, I... I'm really speechless. Um, personally, I am so thrilled for you. I am so happy for our students here. I have been smiling ever since you got the mission, ever since you launched. You deserve all of the best things in the world. You are a special person. That's what happens to MIT students. They are special. Um, and Jack is one of our best. And I could just go on and on, but I'll save that for later once you get back over drinks. Um, I, I I'll pay will, you when I pay you when I get home. Oh, yeah. Uh, kids, the questioners, yo, folks, my people, my people. I will turn over to you. Right. Hi, Jack. My name is Barrett Slegelmilk. I'm a first year grad student here at MIT in the Leaders for Global Operations program. Uh, my question is, NASA has been sending astronauts to space for over half of a century, and, yeah. and uh, training has continued to evolve over the years. And what was the most surprising thing to you when you first arrived in space? Well, you know, no matter how much training you have, it, it it just can't prepare you for how awesome it is up here. Um, one of one of my uh, colleagues said that I was like a, a smart little 12 year old in the middle of Disneyland after two shots of espresso, because I'm just so excited. Um, you know, eight minutes after lighting the motor, uh, I look out the window and I see, you know, what I've only seen in pictures and you just can't get it from a picture you have to experience because there's almost a soul to it and the reality is just so amazing and then when you're here and i know everybody there uh can relate to this when you when you find a new way to look at a problem uh it 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 makes your mind grow and this station every day my mind is growing and and thinking in three dimensions and and it is it's a it's an incredible experience that I think makes you better, and that's why I really uh, uh, really feel that that we should explore more and that we should get more people involved in this, uh, because no matter how much training you have to experience this and to to have this regenesis of 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 excitement and uh, wanting to explore is is something that that we just can't capture any other way. Hi, Jack. Uh, my name is Christine Chappelle, and I'm currently a sophomore in the Department of Aeroastro. And I was wondering, before you launched, what did you think the most important part of your training is? And now that you're up there, has that answer changed? Well, you know, it, it probably hasn't because emergency training is, is kind of the most important. We have to know that stuff cold uh, so that we can just do it uh, in an emergency you know, you have a fire, a depress, or something like that, you can't really sit there and talk about it. So that is the most important. It's what we spend the most time on, and it is rightly so. Uh, the other stuff, our trainers in Houston, uh, well, all around the world, from Russia to Japan to Germany to Houston, everywhere, uh, Canada, um, they do a great job of getting us ready. Uh, giving us the skills we need. We're kind of jacks of all trade, master of none. So uh, we need to just be able to look at a problem, have the general skills, figure it out and do it. And, and they do a really good job of training us to do that. Uh, the other stuff you, you pick up from your crew members who have been here. And I'm super lucky. I have 
you know, Peggy Whitson, Dr. Whitson, who has more time on space than any U.S. astronaut, and Fyodor Yurchikin has even more. Uh, this is his fifth space flight. So two very experienced guys, plus uh, Tomas Pesquet and Oleg Novitsky, uh, are, are just great. So they, they teach me everything else I need to know. I think, uh, I think emergency, yes, most important, and they did a good job of it. Everything else, we, we've learned the skills or we get it up here. Dobre utra, Colonel Fisher. Uh, it's refreshing to see the scientific communities of the U.S. and Russia working so closely to uh, maintain manned space flight at a time when uh, other tensions between the countries are so heightened. Uh, what would you identify as some unexpected commonalities and differences you found between yourself and, say, Fyodor and Oleg? Well, you didn't say your name, but you should have, because I think that's John. And I've known John a while. I actually work for his dad down in Eglin. So hello, John Graham and Dobre Utra. Uh, yes. Yes, I think that uh, um, I think that the International Space Station is the greatest example of international cooperation in the history of humanity, bar none. We had 15 countries come together and make an amazing international laboratory. Um, every day we're working together. We just had an emergency procedures drill that had people on all sorts of continents all around the world working together with us. Uh, you know, it's just amazing. And it's every day. And being able to, to show the world and, and serve as an example of what you can do when you work together is is really important to us. Uh, Fyodor and I have kind of an unofficial emblem for our our mission that's modeled after Apollo Soyuz, and looks just like the the uh, the Apollo Soyuz patch, but it's the the saying is Adna Commanda, so one team, and it's one team working together to accomplish great things. Um, you know, uh, as far as differences and similarities. The similarities are the important things. So uh, hard work, uh, integrity, and a desire to explore, we all have that or we wouldn't be here. And the other stuff, it's just not that important to our shared future. So we focus on what we have in common. We respect our each other's cultures and we try to dive into that and, and get to know and appreciate the goodness of that everyone brings. But when it comes down to it, the most important stuff we share, those morals and values, and we can, we can leverage that to work together and do great things. Thank you, sir. Sorry for screwing up rule number one of Air Force briefings. <laughs> Hi, Jack. My name is Piper. I'm a junior in the aerospace department here. And uh, in high school, my senior year, I had the remarkable opportunity to meet and talk with some astronauts. And it helped me realize my own calling as an engineer and choose to come study here at MIT. I was just curious uh, what you think we can do to continue inspiring young people about aerospace and engage them in space exploration? You know, uh, the answer is all of us need to do it. Um, you know, a lot of times we're like, oh, well, NASA should have this program or or this education outreach. Yeah, we should, but it's it's on all of us. You, me, people at NASA, people at MIT, we need to inspire those who follow us. Um, when I was at MIT, you know, I was helping with uh, the ROTC detachment and going down to a local elementary school and every now and again teaching a science lesson. Um, it doesn't sound like much, but you never know what that seed is that's that's going to ignite in someone just like it did for you so take take your passion you people at mit i guarantee are super passionate about what you're doing you love you love the sciences you live it so spread that take what you have and spread it we are at th probably the most exciting time in space exploration in my lifetime for sure because there's so much going on. We got this sweet, sweet station. We have commercial crew coming online. We're building the biggest rocket in the history of mankind. We're 
we're doing all sorts of things and it's, it's gaining momentum. We're building an infrastructure that we can really launch off of. There's probably somebody in that room who's going to walk on Mars. I guarantee there's plenty of people in that room who are going to contribute to it. So take that, take what you have and spread it behind you. Uh, we, we all need to take a part in that. And any, any form of media that you have, Twitter or Snapchat or whatever, spread it. Spread the gospel of space flight. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Jack. My name is Martina, and I'm a an, uh, junior here. I was wondering, what are your interactions with the rest of your astronauts like in terms of uh, seniority? Is there a hierarchy? And also, what percentage of your tasks are individual versus collaborative? That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's not quite as regimented as what I was used to in the military. Uh, but it certainly is, especially in, uh, we mentioned emergency situations. Um, Peggy is our commander right now. She's, she's the boss. So in those emergency situations, we need to follow what she's directing us to do because there's not time for a democracy. You just got to get it done. Um, here in a month or two, Fyodor will take over. He'll be the commander, and, and it's the same thing. And obviously, they have so much experience. That just makes sense. Um, other than that... You know, we're such a small crew, and, and we, uh, in the USOS section, the three of us, are together most of the day. The Russians are together most of the day. We come together for meals. You know, definitely spend a lot of time together. But as far as delineation between uh, doing tasks on your own or together, um, we have a lot of individual tasks. Uh, we try to get them done and be efficient, and when we w walk by and see somebody having a I'm sorry, I said walk by. When we float by, because that's awesome, when we float by and we see they're having an issue, then we stop and help them. Um, and then for the really big stuff, they actually schedule both of us or even three of us to work on the same item. So it just depends on what task you're doing. If it's a really big, complicated thing, there might be more than one person. Uh, but we try, to, we try to work together as a team regardless and, and just get the job done. Hi, Jack. I'm Logan Kleiss. I'm an undergraduate class of 2019. Um, first of all, thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk to you. It's really awesome. And my question is, is how regimented is your time on the station? And when you do have free time, what do you do? It's pretty darn regimented. First off, thank Joyce because she put it together and she's awesome. She's my girl. Uh, second, as far as regimentation, there, you know, we we uh, we have this little red line that grow, goes across our schedule, and they're anywhere from a three-hour or four-hour task to a five-minute task, and you know, depending on what you're doing, it it gets a little gets a little tricky to keep up. Um, we have to work out uh, six days a week, two and a half hours a day. Uh, that's so we don't come back, you know, walking around like a 90-year-old dude. Um, with bone and muscle loss, then we have to, you know, just living up here is, you know, you got to do things that you don't have to do on the ground. You know, hygiene's different and getting our food out of a, you know, spigot in the wall is different. So there's just stuff you have to do um, to, to survive. So um, that takes up time. And then you have to look at the next day. So when you put all that together, there's not a lot of free time, but the free time you have, you're rewarded with the most amazing views you have you could ever imagine. Um, I can float over to any one of these windows, open it up, you know, day or night, look outside and see things you just, you just can't imagine. It just, it, it doesn't even make sense to me, you know, before I saw them. Last night we were taking pictures of where we're gonna go do EVAs and I was in the Russian, uh, one of the modules, and I'm looking down, waiting for the sunrise to take these pictures. And there's this huge thunderstorm over China. And, you know, we always see thunderstorms from below. And sometimes you'll see cloud to cloud lightning. But I was seeing cloud to cloud, cloud to ground, over top lightning. It was, like, awesome. 
it was so beautiful. It was like it was alive. So, you know, if we have free time, we're probably taking pictures or calling home or, you know, trying to share these this amazing experience with the world with uh, tweets or whatever. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Collins, uh, Jack. I wish I was up there with you. Uh, I know you're shepherding uh, dozens. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the Mike Collins? No, no. Im Im <laughs> Im imposter, but I do have a question for you, and that is, uh, I know you're uh, shepherding uh, dozens of experiments there. Which one is your uh, favorite, or, or, or maybe better, which one do you think is most important? What's showing evidence of being able to improve our lives uh, here on Earth? Man, sir, it's a pleasure to talk to you. If, uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but I got to sit with you a, a few years ago at, at the MIT banquet. Um, what an honor. Uh, as far as, as experiments, sir, you know, I think that that you proved in, in Apollo and, and in the early space program that sometimes the most impactful things that we discover are answers to questions we didn't know we had. And I think that, you know, I can go through and list dozens of experiments that I'm working on because of this unique environment without gravity and convection and sedimentation, we can grow perfect crystals. We can do all these wonderful things, but it might be the most innocuous experiment that has the biggest effect. And I also think that inspiration is is hard to quantify, but has such a huge impact. When I was working on the Raptor, uh, I asked that, you know, they said they found out I wanted to apply for the astronaut program. And 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 I said, well, how many of you guys, you know, got interested in engineering because of space? Every single person in the room raised their hand. It was guys from 20 to 60, and every single one raised their hand. So that's what you did, sir, and that's what we hope we can continue to do uh, to get the next generation going and to, and to really get this whole space exploration thing moving uh, for good. You certainly are doing it, Jack, uh, big time and a lot better than we ever did. Thank you for your work up there. So I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to try to be quick. But uh, I'm Andrew Owens. I'm a PhD candidate here at MIT and uh, did my undergrad at Rice University. Um, I also had a question about sort of technologies and development uh, and what in particular you think are innovative technologies that have the potential for the most benefit, and how would your life on the station be different now if we had those technologies today? You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably talking too long for each question, and I, I wanna get everybody through. Uh, as, far as, as far as your question, up here in the space station, uh, the space station is, a, is an evolution of technology, so we just keep updating it as we go. It's 15 years old, but we have some of the most modern equipment in the world. So it's not the biggest, uh, it wouldn't have the biggest impact. The biggest impacts for us are the efficiency that we see uh, coming with uh, the commercial providers uh, making space more accessible, uh, you know, first uh, reusing first stage, uh, new engines like Blue Origin, SpaceX, you know, Sierra Nevada, uh, Cygnus, all of these orbital, all of these uh, companies are making space more affordable. And that is important. The other thing that we need for any uh, deeper exploration is propulsion. And uh, right now, you know, when we're talking specific impulse around 400, that's about as good as we get with the liquid and we need to do better. And some of the newer technologies are in the tens of thousands for specific impulse. And even though it might be the thrust of a butterfly fart, if you point the butterfly in the right direction for long enough and keep him farting, uh, he'll get going pretty fast in space. So we need to develop those technologies so that that six-month trip to Mars is 30 days. 
and then we don't have to worry about the radiation. I think that's probably the key for us to really push deeper into the galaxy. you. Everybody who didn't get to ask a question, you're using my time. Say your name. Say, Jack, we're going to do this again. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Good to see you again. Uh, it was great to meet you at SpaceX, and I'm really happy to finally see you in space. I'm too short for this. Hi, I'm Kayla. We will take a brain check. Hi, I'm Kayla. We will take a brain check. Hi, Jack. I'm Eric. I'll shoot okay. you a text, and we'll talk about virtual reality later. Okay. Uh, and, Hi, Jack. My name is Ronnie Foreman. I'm a second year candidate here, and I did my undergrad at Georgia Tech, and I will talk to you next time. Thanks very much. Jack, you did a phenomenal job. We are so Our, proud of you here. You, you cannot begin to imagine. Well, I'm sorry I talked so long. I adore you, Jack. You can talk until you're blue in the face. You are amazing. You are a burrito <laughs> of awesomeness covered in awesome sauce, my friend. Burrito of awesomeness! All right. Oh, watch. I'm going to do a flip. You ready? Here we go. Read my socks. Did you read them? One more time. Slower. One more time. Slower. Oh. <laughs> my wife gave me these. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all the participants and guests from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication. <laughs>